Right. And there are different subsections of, of law. Um, we will see how far we go. Um, there's also a maximum intake of this topic per hour or per session. Um, I might spread this out into next week as a review, uh, adding new elements to it. So that's a, for those who are tired already, there's a slim chance we're doing early evening. I go with my typical pace. We'll go where we at. Um, it's about 90 slides, lots of visuals in between. Yeah, but there are blank spaces and fun stuff in between. It's not like completely. I'm going to read my notes as well from here, because some stuff is really important. All right. You ever heard about NIMBY? Not in my backyard. Yeah? So called NIMBYism. Super simple example to understand this. You buy a house, or rent an apartment, beautiful little neighborhood, and six months later after you bought the house, people are starting to build new flats and new houses behind your, be uh, behind your home. Yeah? They showed you a subdivision plan, you signed a contract with the builders, you moved into the house, you knew phase two is coming. Now you complain about the apartment buildings in phase two that have been presented to you. That's pretty much not in my backyard. Oh, here, ooh, ooh, very old example, ooh, art, very old. That's the wind power thing, it comes back and back and back, you know? Not commenting on that, but once in a while it pops up. Nuclear power plant is the example. Yeah? NIMBY is not in my backyard. I don't want to have a nuclear power plant in my backyard. Yeah? Because it's a nuisance. Yeah? It's kind of funny because we discussed this uh, in Finland once. NIMBYism in an in a economic development class. And I said, well, you have Murmansk in your backyard, which is a Russian submarine uh, naval station. Yeah? So pretty much a few hundred miles away from you, uh, sitting some nuclear uh, powered submarines, rusting. Not in my backyard. Uh, not in my backyard, typical uh, example. All the changes, all the above changes in your existing status quo, in your environment, a, a normally that occurs is what you don't want. New traffic? Don't want that. Yeah? Uh, change in parking, don't want that. But this is example here, classic governmental uh, uh, or, comp or utility company, uh, don't want that. No power lines. Huh? Don't even think about crossing my property to doing some stuff. Huh? So NIMBYism, kind of very interesting concept. So, why don't we talk about Zoning law and planning law. We are talking about the constitutional principles. Huh? And let's do a lecture on notes. Quick. Um, or head reports. Here we go. I have, I have other comments in here. So, it works both. So, when we talk about zoning and planning law, Zoning is later on an element. We talk in particular about the two processes and two funded constitutional principles. A is the due process, 14th Amendment, yeah? and taking of property, the 5th Amendment. Yeah? So take away from that slide, policing power, governmental power, comes from the Constitution based on 14 and 5. That's power 5. Yeah? I'm in domain we are going to have today. So, if I look at this, as can, I can argue that the due process clause prohibits state and local governments from depriving persons of life, liberty, and property without certain steps being taken to ensure fairness. The whole idea of life, liberty, and property. Where did you, have you heard that before? Life, liberty, and property. What is power? Hmm? Give me a, give me an answer, come on. Like liberty and the 
pursuit of happiness, yeah. Every firefighter will tell you that the same thing. When it comes to natural disasters, wildfires, they will take you away from your house to protect your, your safety and your liberty. Huh? Property is a secondary thing in this case, though, for the emergency management situation. Huh? Persons of life, liberty, and property. So, then we have the procedural due process, this, that's the constitutional right to laws and legal processes that are not unreasonable, arbitrary, or capricious. As in, I tell you five weeks ahead of time that you have to evict your home rather than five minutes before you do so. The firefighter example is if the light fire is right next to your property line, I give you two minutes to get out of the house. Don't give you two weeks. Uh, the substantive due process uh, is the constitutional right to laws and legal processes that are legitimated, legitimated to a public purpose, public health, safety, and welfare. That's the firefighter one. Health, health, safety, and welfare. Okay, wrong mouse. The 14th Amendment reads, I highlighted one sec sec sentence, and this is, is by the textbook we can go. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall ab ab abridge the privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, and property without due process of law. Huh? Again, this is laid out when we talk about in real estate development, residential use versus office use, commercial use. Yeah? This goes down to the Constitution 14 and 15. Yeah? Because we have here the policing powers and the governmental powers of that. All right, any questions? If we do this in terms of land use, land development, there are a bunch of questions you have to consider. Yeah? In general, if you answer one of those with yes, you got a problem. Or a lawsuit. Yeah? So, does the regulation make sense in the public context? I hope so. Supposedly the government gov is governed by the people. Yeah? Government is in any governmental entity. We will have that in a moment. Yeah? Does the regulation affect a response to public needs for health, safety, and welfare? If I take away Paul's car, that is taking our personal property, but it's probably not a benefit to the public's needs of health, safety, and welfare. Huh? Unless he's using that to run down University Street up and down and aiming for people. Well, that's a different thing. <laughs> you might be too young for that, but there used to be a really weird computer game. I had a roommate who played that. You would run people over. I don't condone that. It's really weird, like a scooter thing. So it was, it was very hip in the late 90s. So I don't know. But here, this is the cool stuff. This is where it gets nasty. <laughs> Is the property still owner still allowed some use of the land? We will have a long discussion tonight about the so-called diminishing economic returns of that of land. Not just change in value, but are the economic means of a land deprived by a certain action? Huh? Let's take Paul again. If I take Paul's computer away. I directly impact his performance in this class. If his typing is the economic value or the economic means of his performance, yeah, I take away the laptop, he cannot use that laptop anymore for the fullest joy and pleasure. Yeah. If I give the laptop back to him for 10 minutes per hour, I might get away with that because he still has time that he can use his land or the computer property, both is differentiate later on is just land. But he can still 
use that land or the laptop. I try to make this a little bit close up, you know, rather than <coughs> you have a mining rights underneath your house. Okay? Is harm to the property indirect rather than direct? Take away his laptop, format the whole thing, give him the laptop back. No, still harmed him. No? Well, probably, I think now you're done for today. No? So, I'm gonna give you some solid backgrounds. There are a bunch of things I just throw out, a bunch of things that are a paragraph in the book. I think it's important that you have been exposed to a little bit more. Not just for an exam, but general understanding what's going on in this process when we call land development. No? We're talking today about the legal framework of those folks who are sitting at the other side of the desk when you walk into a city hall uh, or planning department and say, hey, I would like to have a deck permit or a building permit. I would like to purchase some land. Can you show me the deed of the land? Because we want to take care of certain deed descriptions. Yeah? So we're throwing out a few things and uh, next week review. So we've got to stick. All right, solving background. Power to zone <coughs> trickles down again from four, uh, 5 and 14 as literally a very boring language as in zoning is an exercise of the government's police power. There's something about the home rule to mention the so-called Dillon's rule. The municipal corporations owe their origin to derive their powers and rights wholly from the legislator, aka the constitution in this case. No? So, you have under this ruling, again, this is health, safety, and welfare. You have the authority that a chartered municipality have the power to sell their property. No? So remember when we talk about cities, like particular medieval cities, the right to the city, what was the other rights of a city? To govern, to tax, coin and the protectionist power of being a citizen of that city, yeah? protective walls. Yeah? So now here is you actually have the so-called police power, which is kind of interesting because you don't think about zoning as policing power. Because if you have a zoning violation, it's not the black and white car that shows up with an officer inside, uniform officer. No, it's actually code enforcement showing up. Well, law enforcement, code enforcement, a uh, little cheap side sticker on a city of plantation, small little black book, and boom, you have a citation because you didn't have a building permit. Didn't happen to me yet. Can't teach this stuff and not getting permits. Uh, mm -hmm. But the police power is possessed by lo local and regional and state government. And please forgive me that I read some of those sentences out. Uh, because this is kind of the legal language with it. We've got to point out the important thing to it and make a discussion. Local, regional, and state government. There are also certain jurisdictions, and if they have jurisdic uh, jurisdiction agreements, all that, who helps whom, that's regulated in that. Yeah? Power to use taxation. We just heard that. How would I, what's the tax I put on property? Property tax. Yeah? And what else? Depending where you add, you could then use for a municipality a school district tax. You could have certain levies uh, accepted. Bonds could be put on there. Yeah. So it's not just property tax. It adds a few other certain taxations on it. Yeah. Depending on the jurisdiction. And I, I give this lecture as a, uh, a channel view. I don't drill this down down to the city of Davie, town of Davie, yeah? or particular state of Florida. I present examples across time, across the US. So some of the slides will talk about Boney, uh, the BCA, the Board of Zoning Appeals. Certain states have that, certain states don't. Yeah? In Delaware, you don't have a zoning, you have a zoning appeal board, but then you actually go up to the Supreme Court, which is different from the United States Supreme Court. But it's a Superior Court Supreme Court in Delaware. 
Huh? Not getting into that, those details, just wanted to let you know if there's something off with the language, it's more the general rep on this. Yes, please. So the federal government has no zoning authority? Good question. Would you argue, who, who thinks the federal government has a zoning authority? authority? Federal government. Are we talking about the power zone exercise of government's police power? It's a good question. I never had the question. Other question. There are federal lands, are there? Well, BLM is managing that. Yeah. So there are federal, federal, um, uh, federal property. Extreme case is embassies. In this case, though. I would go no. In this case, I would go no. But the federal government has certainly the powers to designate uh, uh, land categories. Yeah. So, don't know. Please read in between the lines. I am not a, uh, a lawyer. I will look that up for you. I will find out. Yeah. Interesting question. Um, you have military installations, you have embassies, you have institutional installations. National parks, uh, federal lands. Um, you have uh, airspace, the sovereignty of actually national space. Um, so I would argue yes. Don't know if I can argue based on just five and fourteen. Yeah, because technically the power to zone on five and fourteen comes from the constitution into that form of government. But the federal government is kind of sitting on the bench in this discussion. So, good question. Really good question. Okay, title of government. Huh? Power from the state, constitution, we have this, 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 this subdivision, we go. Let's put them all up. Come on. We have a conversation on that. I'm talking about local government, municipal governments here. Yeah? So don't have here the um, state powers and federal government powers. Right? The type of political subdivisions is a little bit misleading when it says political subdivisions. Um, but what we do with this is we are going to, how to phrase that? If we have different ways to organize our space, in uh, subdivisions, and this is in this case it's a legal subdivision versus the subdividing of property. Yeah? We have different uh, systems to organize that. Yeah? Like you would also say there's a um, different so-called state of politics in political sides. Yeah? Um, keep in mind, I mentioned that here with the Dillon rule, you have municipal government or corporation, counties, townships. You don't have parishes in Florida. That's a Louisiana thing. That's a southern belt. Yeah. Or we have special districts. What is an example for a special district? Anywhere. What could be an example for a special district? Yeah, DC is District of Columbia. Yeah. I'm thinking smaller scale. Special district. Hey, who is not living on campus? Paying your water bills recently? No. No? Yes. All right. So water management districts, huh? let's say for environmental purposes or for utility purposes, could be more. I worked uh, on projects with a large one so called MSD, the Metropolitan Sewer District, years ago in Cincinnati. Yeah? So those are, think utilities could be governed as a special district. Technically, a school district works as a special district. Has certain rules, certain fundings, certain budgets, yeah? certain political functions, yeah. Would like a, a military base also be like a special district, since it's kind of self-contained? 
Yeah, but like Andrew pointed out, if the fun. government functions, I would go with a military installation, um, which usually, again, if it's outside of that, outside of the own country, let's say Rammstein Air Force Base in Germany, it's American uh, American law on base. You step outside, you're in German law. Yeah, so there are the different rules of governing uh, on those. Uh, embassy is the perfect example. Technically. Don't know if that, that has changed. Um, ships and airlines. Mm -hmm. Technically, the old, old school stereotype and rule is for if you take off in, in Europe, in an American uh, uh, airliner, the moment it takes off, you're in a, U, in a US property. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, fun fact if you are going to the Caribbean on a big boat, Depending on what kind of flag that ship is flying, your alcohol laws are different. Huh? Not that I encourage drinking, <laughs> um, but certainly some students that are not 21 did encourage probably being on a ship that flies like Maltese or Tobacco or whatever comp companies that you're flying with, because then the legal drinking age is 18. Huh? Same thing, unless you're doing a school trip. No, but difference. I had to be. A friend of mine, we met actually on a boat flying from Tavalu, something really exotic. Tavalu, yeah. And um, she's from Norway. And we're like, oh, are you happy that you're flying a different flag? Uh, and she's like, did not understand what we mean because of the different frameworks. And we're like, you would be on a US boat. You will not be allowed to train because you're below 18, um, below 21. Yeah? Fun fact comes a little bit here, a little bit offset because we it's not land development, but it's still different rules, different setups. Yeah? So military installations definitely different codes, also different legal code and uh, processing. Yeah? If you do something stupid on a military base, you're doing military code yeah? and all that. Some of you guys are like. Mm -hmm. Alright, so this is the boring part. Sorting decisions are divided into two main categories, legislative and administrative. Huh? Two different categories. Legislative action occurs when new law is made and changes are enacted in existing laws as they are applied generally to a specific piece of property. One thing to really keep in mind. I talk about zoning here all the time. Power of policing. Huh? It's law. Your zoning designation on your piece of property is law. The map that shows red, blue, yellow, green, and the one that says existing uh, land use map and zoning map on the other product, it's the law. It's like literally crazy book like this in color code per property on your map. We're going back to the web page of our city of the town of Delhi in a few, so you can take a look at that if you want to. Very important. This is not just, uh, yeah, it's sold residential or sold for industrial office or something. No, it's actually a law dedication to the land use expressed in the zoning ordinance. Yeah? That's the legislative part. Any games tonight? Because uh, you're on the phone all the time today. Are you watching uh, Yeah? No. All right, just want to make sure. Then, yeah? In the zoning context, adopt new zoning regulations or amend the existing zoning text or map. You also are, as a government, you're also under the pressure. The moment you change a zoning law, an ordinance, it gives you, depending on which state you're working, it gives you a specific time frame until that change has to be put in place. Well, if I say the green in front of the library shall be rezoned, uh, I'm resolving this into residential space from open space into residential. I need to make sure that this act 
is done within a year. If not, I'm in non-compliance with my zoning code. Huh? And it had happened that smaller cities are messed up with this, and then you actually have a problem. Administrative zoning decisions are those which are permitted by the zoning legislation to modify zoning regulations as they are applied to specific pieces of property. So there is the legislation of the zoning, and there's the administration of the zoning. There are different processes. If something goes wrong in that application standard here, in that process, you can get sued, or you have the right to sue. Simple thing, I don't know when I bring it, but let's say, you actually have a piece of land, you want to zone up, you have re single family residential on there right now, but you want to do apartments. You actually have a timeline in the process until what date and what time you need to post certain things. Post a sign on the property, visible. Huh? make an announcement in a local newspaper or have a local post at the city hall. Some cities are doing this digital now. Yeah. Um, if you look at local newspapers, there was also sometimes some sewing appliance uh, application here or rezoning here. Yeah. If you don't do this the right way, let's say you have to post it 20 days before the meeting, and you post it three days before the meeting, everyone that did not be, was not able to attend that meeting has a standing to complain about it. If I do rezoning, depending on the state, I have to invite every direct adjacent neighbor to that zoning hearing. No? Every one of those. So, rezoning property, don't, you have the guys to the left, to the right, to the front, and to the back. Invite those diagonal as well, because you'll share the one point at the post at the back end. Building permit. And you got a permit, but like, the neighbors get that too. No, nope. building permit. Goes here. Administrative uh, processes. If you're remodeling your house, you're changing the interior of your house, you need a building permit. Yeah. Probably you need a general contractor and a building permit. Um, but you, unless you change the exterior of your house significantly, like as in you put something on it, 500 square foot uh, attachment or something, or 1,000 square foot attachment, new garage, that's different. But still, based on the municipality, could be still going through the regular approval process as in you sit down with the guy at the planning department, they look at it, put a stamp on it, sign off. And then, but like, why do, like, why do neighbors get like, letters in the mail asking, like, I'm like, are you okay with this? That's the zoning designation. That's different. Yeah? And depending on which state and which municipality you are, you also have regulations of notification. Again, administrative decision process. Yeah? For certain steps, you need to notify your neighbors. Um, I did a project for a friend of mine, fun fact, because I didn't work in that, in that town for years, but um, they opened, they took an old theater, remodeled the theater, put a distillery in there. Um, finest chain you can imagine. Um, don't want to make this lecture about alcohol, but this is a media <laughs> like, If you do a restaurant business, you have to invite and notify everyone in an ex thousand feet of the property. So they actually ended up adding a beer garden, outdoor seating, and a small warehouse unit on the back side of there. Therefore they actually had to notify all those guys. And I helped them with GIS and said, okay, in thousand foot radius, pick all the mailing addresses and generate that list for the invite. Why? 
because you want to make sure that you're doing everything with the standards in the particular situation, in a particular order. Yeah? Well, they literally send out a thousand letters, something, a no, thousand feet radius, some 400 letters total. Every property owner, even if it was a vacant parcel, got that. Certified mail, receipt of the USPS, put it into the binder, here, let's go to the sorting uh, hearing a few weeks later. Yeah? No vetoes, no complaints. You're going to do this by the book. Yeah? This is, if you miss a deadline, sometimes it's easier just to sit this out and wait until, and, and then redo it the right way. Unless you have wait times of six to eight months or longer. This is not done in the weekend. Yeah? Depending on the size of activities in your community, for data I think six to eight months right now. So you really need to make sure that you're on the books with your timeline. All right. There's also quasi judicial processes, yeah, because you're dealing here with the administrative decision. We're going to take, we're going to take a look at variances, a little bit on CUs, uh, administrative appeals. I took that out. Yeah. Different powers to zone. Of course, there's always an exception. We have this, yeah. Powers to adopt and enforce such poli local police, sanitary, and other similar regulations are not in conflict with general laws. Yeah? Similar idea we had earlier here, chartered municipalities. As in, we wrote a manifest, we are now a city. Therefore, we have certain obligations to serve our citizens. Yeah? Therefore, let's have a conversation about sewer lines. Counties and townships can only exercise those powers given to them by the state. Yeah? As an example, yes, you have the power to govern, but you might be such a small town that you don't actually have a, uh, your own police force. So there might be an arrangement with the local county to cover that up with the local county sheriff department. Huh? A little VP. I will share some of those slides because they're sometimes very tricky on the wording. One is quasi, one is the real world. Yeah. All right, here comes the Board of Sorting Appeals. This is from the state of Delaware in this case. Applying criteria from Sony code to a specific property. That is the thing. It's property based. Yeah? It's not subdivision based, town based, county based. It's property driven legal framework. Yeah? And based on the facts, again, presented at hearings. Hello, my name is Dr. Thomas Witzer. I reside on this blah blah blah, blah address. I am an adjacent neighbor of the property in discussion. This is how you introduce yourself on the microphone that is recorded. You're going on the record with this. Huh? Sworn testimony recorded, cross-examination. You can speak in favor or against a certain zoning if it's up in, in the, in the uh, planning and zoning commission. Look, right. you ever had a chance to go to a planning and sorting meeting? PNC meeting? They're fun. They're highly bureaucratic. Huh? You can pick out the you can pick out the engineer immediately, you can pick out in, immediately the overpriced land use lawyer. Huh? Um coolest planning and sorting meeting I had was where the land use lawyer showed up in t-shirt and jeans. As in, I took. I was gardening this afternoon, and my, and my friend walked by and asked me to represent him. And literally came in there. Really fun discussion. Perfect. No objections. Nothing. But in in sheets and in, in t-shirt. Yeah. Um, and then you have sometimes you have uh, engineer teams come in. Everyone in suit. I was like, the mayor is sitting there in jeans and a, and a polo. You guys are coming in with, with Armani suits. 
wrong perception of your audience. Yeah? Get it dressed up a little bit. If you're, if you're doing blending and zoning in the Midwestern or, or West, West Coast town, consider boots rather than sneakers or leather shoes. Yeah? That's the difference. Um, I had once a county commissioner meeting on wildfires, and the county commissioner was also the, the county's vet. Blue bib, old truck, yeah? and yeah, rubber boots. That's how we did our meeting. Lucky me, I was in shorts and t shirt. Yeah? Informal meeting. And I got, got to go down to the farm, got to take care of some cattle. Want to come? We'll be back in two hours. I'm like, sure, let's do it. Instead of sitting in an office. Got to adapt to this. Yeah? All right, so administrative sorting actions. Again, there are certain procedures that need to be uphold. Think about this. Federal example, local example. You have to register to vote with your local municipality or with the state of Florida before you go and cast the vote at the ballot. Huh? You can't mix it up. You can't go there and vote and then say, yeah, let me register. Paying on the state maybe works. Yeah? So you have to take a few things step by step File a zoning application. Do your homeworks. Inform adjacent neighbors. Yeah? All this part of the prep. Same thing here in classes. Have a study plan. What do you want to study over the course of the next two or three years? Sign up for the class. Show up for the class on time. Stay in the class until you fall asleep yeah? or dismissed. Do well in the exams. Graduate. Huh? Can't graduate without signing up for class. Doesn't work like that. Huh? The only way you get a degree like that is honoris um, doctoral. Huh? Like our board, some of our board members get that because they're so dedicated to the community. So they get an honoris um, doctoral degree. All right. Variants. Any idea what the variants could be? What could be a variance? Yes, please. Isn't it basically like getting an exception to the zoning law? Getting an exception. Some alternative solution temporarily. Huh? Variance authorizes the landowner to establish or maintain a use which is prohibited by the zoning regulations. It's like a hall pass. Huh? Here, nobody leaves to go to the bathroom, but here's the hall pass. You can go to the bathroom for five minutes. Variance huh? <coughs> results in deviation from the little import of the audience. Oh, too much, too much language. The important part is here. Only upon showing practical difficulties or unnecessary hardship. There are certain elements to that. Yeah. Certain uh, the elements on the solely variance to have examples. Oh, they come back later. Is if something is maybe grandfathered in, that's a term we use, yeah? where they say, okay, fine, this is an establishment that is sitting here for three generations, we are going to execute a variance for that because that kind of use of that property is kind of grandfathered in. Yeah? Um, depending on the jurisdiction or municipality, variances are very easy to get and some are completely out of your mind ideas. Yeah? Technically, if you start doing an outdoor shop out of your garage, you're changing the economic purposes of your property. Therefore, you actually would need then a yeah. exemption. Yeah? So, the trick is here, which is prohibited by the zoning regulations. So if it's single family residential, yes, it's residential, but not necessarily 25 apartment build, uh, apartments in one building next door, because that's a different zone. So you could maybe reach an agreement that you up zone and make a change with a zoning variance. Typically, churches are getting zoning variances. Because you could start your own church in your garage, yeah? 
and you grow and grow and grow and grow until someone complains about the traffic huh? and you're protected under the constitution. You just have to make arrangements. Florida is a little bit different because there might be a homeowner association involved as well. Huh? Yes, this is actually real cases. Saturday night, Saturday prayers or Friday night, Friday afternoon prayers in your garage turning into like little convoc uh, convocation, place of worship. You're protected actually, depending on certain rules around it. I'm not sure if we get to that today. It's a little bit too crazy for real estate development, but there are little cases out there. Yeah? Talking about flamingos later too. So, conditional use, a CU. The conditional use is a use expressly permitted by the zoning code within the zoning district, but it has temporarily granted access. So here's the trick. I said if you start your garage into a mechanics shop, you're changing the, the uh, economic means and purposes of your property. Yeah? If you happen to have, let's say, an old shed in the backyard that used to be like a small manufacturer mechanics shop, yeah, let's say some uh, metal plate smithing thing, yeah, and you start doing this exercise again because grandfather had that, you start doing it, you could go for conditional use even if it's residential neighborhood might be able to get that. Now here's the kicker. If you cease operations and stop doing the economic means and purposes of that business then, yeah, your conditional use will be voided. We have seen conditional use as well in, let's say, environmentally difficult situations. Let's say you build something in the foothill areas. We don't really have foothills, but let's say very close to the beaches, protective sort of areas. I can give you a conditional use that you're allowed to develop that land for the next two years. I literally give you an expiration date and say, 1st of October in two years, you have to have development in place. I can stipulate that as in graded infrastructure in place, all the piping in place to put a building on top. Yeah? Or fully developed, as an example. If you happen to not do that, the conditional use is voided. It's like milk turning sour, you can't drink it then. You know? Very cool element to face timed development. And I basically say here, for two years you have the permission to build this. If you fail to do so, come back, we need to talk again. <coughs> In two years, different county commissioner, different planning commissioner, different philosophy of the city written in a comprehensive plan. Philosophy has changed. Also, you might just got that conditional use and then 2008 happened. And nobody wants to buy $350,000 homes at that moment, even if the view is perfect. There's no money for that. So what do you do? You wait until the market changes. Two years later, the market has changed, people are interested, boom, your zoning has expired. Very tricky. Alright, quick overview of what is the difference between both. A variance permits something which is otherwise prohibited in the spiosonic ordinance. Well, the level of prohibited is important. Typically, if they are closely related to each other, yes, you get those variants. If there's a certain understanding, a marginal wiggle, or wiggle room, yeah? a nuclear power plant in a residential neighborhood, probably not. But if you think you want to open up a daycare in a residential neighborhood, you actually could go with that. Yeah? And then you make certain statements about traffic, uh, uh, nuisance, and all that. Yeah? Conditional use is a use, use permitted in the zoning district, but for which special conditions are established. Important, we will talk about planned unit development. Planned unit development is its own little zoning district. 
it's not a conditional use for a larger uh, um, piece of development. Yeah? Conditional use is function on a specific property, not many properties. Uh, that's a slow, small but efficient different differences. Uh, permits, what's a permit? What type of permits do you know? Okay. Parking permit, construction permit, housing permit, what else? Remodel. You gotta yell at me today. Remodel. Remodel, yeah, that's part of building permits. Alright. Driving permit. Yeah. I have that. Gun permit. <laughs> yeah? Certain processes in the administrative body of a governmental function. Yeah? In terms of zoning, once we have the zoning regulations in place, you can go and obtain a permit for that. Yeah? Because at some point in time they come back and double check if you have the permit and if you, if you sign off. In the case of, let's say, a building permit, at some point of time you submit your plans, they approve it, you get the permit, you build, you construct, they come out in the field and do multiple checkups on uh, where you're at right now and for the steps and sign off on this. Very interesting fun fact. Uh, I had the pleasure last week to um, have a meeting with the developer, responsible developer of Dana Point. If you haven't had a chance yet, check it out. Phase one is open. Lime is open if I can get your burritos. And other f food restaurants are coming. Um, two and a half million square foot of space being developed. Multiple hotels, apartment buildings, ton of retail and fun stuff, office buildings. They are their own little planned unit development, considering themselves as a mixed use development. Uh, and it's right on I 95 between Sterling and Griffin. Both exit and on ramps are part of that as a north south bound, north, north south boundary. Massive, massive example. They're doing so much work and permits and permitting and control for the uh, um, code enforcement as they are building. The city of Dania, Dania Beach, put actually a container on office container on site to manage all the local permits and uh, paperwork locally to reduce the time of driving back and forth between official uh, city uh, um, uh, establishment. And they're putting like two or three, three inspectors on, on site to deal with that. Yeah. It works all the time like this. They change and shift uh, your functions. Uh, he gave, um, he will give actually a presentation in, in my uh, site planning class in two weeks, Saturday afternoon. And uh, just the way, I can't remember, thousands and thousands and thousands of linear foot of sewer pipe put in place, replace the existing main sewer for the city as in we are coming in with extra capacity, you guys can't handle it before you guys have to figure out how to pay for it, here we put it in. Yeah? So really cool. Um, October 5th. So we're going to re-brought it for grad students as well, so more than I come to take a look at it. Or come to class. Grad class. Yeah? October 5th. Oh yeah, and that's the last, the last week before finals, so we're doing mock-up presentations with grad students. Love that, love that. Both like me being Simon Powell. Simon Powell, it like, works like that. Uh, like, hold the music, uh, let's talk about your presentation style. Um, Paul is laughing because he, he knows what I'm talking about for a shark cage. Uh, but, before we take a small break, what do you think I mean with third party standing? What do you think is third party standing? It's not about rock and roll or techno. Outside investors. Outside investors. We're talking about investments right now? Uh, no. We're talking about what? Uh, land development and zoning. Yeah. So, what would be a third party standing in zoning and land development? Maybe like an outside company? Outside company? Yes, please. 
Yeah. So we are, yeah. yeah. Well, you are the in the approval, approval processes of le legislative actions. The rights yeah? of the third party. Hmm? The rights of the third party. The rights of the third party. When am I actually allowed to say, hello, I want to say something? Huh? Small example. Usually requires some special damage distinction. Huh? If I live in Miami and you guys are building a, a construction site or something like this in Davy, I'm so far out of the way, I have zero say in that. Huh? I mentioned directly adjacent neighbors. Yeah? So what if if I receive special damages that make me different? Yeah? As an example, nuisance type standard in many cases. Adjoining property versus owner one mile away. It's different. If the property owner 500 feet in the backyard is behind, let's say, a small little manufacturing plant and the wind blows perfectly in your direction, yes, you probably end up having a third party standing because of the fumes being blasted through the exhaust dropping on your property. Huh? I make this example up, but it's outside. Nuisance type, even worse. Where I live, there's around the corner, is an apartment building. I really hate that ice cream cream at car. I really hate this ice cream van. Because whenever we have some nice days, pretty much every day, at some point when I work from home, I have this ice cream guy coming and playing his music. I cannot stand that. Really? It's so loud. It's, it's like literally nostalgic. you will hear him here when he's at the library. Yeah. Yeah. It's and I was like, there are no kids living in that apartment building. The youngest person you see is like a college person. They and it's it's not Friday at 3 p.m. No one is there. So where my apartment is, I always get the ice cream man. He parks like right out where my apartment is. At, I live at Toscana Place, and he always parks right there. And I'll be trying to study at two or three, and he'll stand there for like three oh, hours, like, and the music just keeps going. <laughs> I end up going to school. It, it, it's, it's, it's weird. It's weird. Yeah, um, but nuisance nuisance law is very interesting. What type of law do you think you want to practice later when you when you're done with law school? Criminal. You know the big bucks are actually land use. Yeah. And really, really land. I had a friend. Um, ten years ago, she left Florida. She was cheap. She did four hundred, five hundred dollars an hour. Four hundred, an hour. An hour. Uh, so yeah, good good land use lawyer, but certain some good good cases and reputation to build, mm -hmm. land use lawyers are awesome. And land use lawyers can always talk about their clients. Because you went just Monday night, you went to a public meeting, public hearing, presented the parcels on this, so now you can tell all the little details about that case. Criminal lawyer, you never can, you do this. Don't judge me, but you're one of the loneliest people on the cocktail party because you can't talk about it. Mm -hmm. yeah? uh, I stop talking about real estate. What do you do? All family. What do you do? Oh, I'm a professor for real estate in business school. Uh, <laughs> next person. What do you do? I'm a scuba instructor. Ooh, scuba diving. Have you seen this and that? Did, did you dive with sharks? I'm like, yeah, sure. What else do you do? Real estate professor. So how about that scuba diving? <laughs> really fun. Yeah? I did not believe that until I really had that. Uh, uh, my scuba trainer actually gave that example uh, from his time at the University of Kentucky uh, being invited as the spouse to an event, talking to the different deans. So what do you do? Oh, yeah, I run a scuba shop. Oh, what's this? What's, what's going on? Yeah, completely different. Yeah. Um, 
better conversation than where are you from? Where's this accent from? Uh, nuisance. Remember that. Uh, land use law, it's highly structured. It's interesting to deal with the, with the cases. Yeah? Every case is a crazy story. All the cases we present today went to the US Supreme Court. Yeah? And there are certain timings you have to consider. But in terms of choices, think about that. Because there's a lot of money to be made in that. Yeah? If, you know, if you know your local jurisdictions, you don't have to know all of them. But be good in two or three big ones. Yeah? And then through training, get that. Yeah? Ah, do an example. Yeah? Some call the presumption is that the neighbors have standing. Yeah? If I want to dig out a pool, I've got to talk to my neighbors usually. Yeah? It's that simple with access to my backyard. Where do you get? How do you get all the dirt out of the backyard? You might be able, you might actually have to pass all your neighbor's property, depending on how that locked you are. Huh? Need, you need to participate in earlier proceedings. You need to build a record of your participation. It's like going to come into class. Last year we had a student, I never had her in my class, and she showed up for final, and I'm like, who are you? <laughs> huh? Banking on the video and a textbook. Huh? Very risky. But it worked. Huh? <laughs> Can't remember the grade. Huh? But in, in, a lot, in a zoning, particularly when you are involved as a neighbor, you need, if you have been legally notified on time, you better show up if you don't like this project. Because the moment that you say yay, sign and seal it, it's the law. Good luck with that appeal. Huh? The appeal as in, ah, I didn't like it to go on the meeting, I didn't want to go to the meeting, no chance. You have to present a record of participation. If you have been to every meeting where they went through the zoning, through the site plan approval, through certain variances because something came up in between in the process, yeah, and even coming for the last hearing where they say, hey, this is going to be the uh, special permit for some extra other thing, if you ever been to all these meetings, you're a known person in the room, and you're on record that you liked or disliked the process. Huh? So participation, again, same thing in class. Third party standing, the Sugar Township Walmart example. Huh? Was a neighboring, do I have the notes in there? Nope. Was a neighboring uh, business, the residents of a neighboring subdivision and residents further back in the subdivision as a case. Huh? So, uh, that is the, the plaza. That was the second part is the one company, those guys. Huh? And then this guy. This guy complained about these developments. But, just looking at it, he is not necessarily the adjacent property owner. Huh? So good luck with that stand. Gonna skip this a little bit more, you can even see this here. Oh, no, no. A favorable local law has allowed Walmart stores to expand in its Sugar Creek, Ohio store, despite determined opposition. Let's scroll this down. We're actually taking a look here at a 2.3 acre property. And the whole idea was the county court dismissed the lawsuit on grounds that the land acquisition and Walmart expansion were proper and legal <coughs> opponents appealed. And at the end, as the area was already sold properly, remember, legislative right executed on the property, Walmart and the shopping center's owner merely sought to develop a permanent use within the already sold area. Super easy. So all the adjacent folks didn't have the right to really complain about that because everything else was part of the legal setup for that particular property. Yeah? Again here, this is the Walmart Center, this is the uh, Sugar Creek Plaza, and one of the guys in here in the subdivision tried to sue with them, complain about them. Yeah? So what was he trying to fight though? Was it like development and expansion? Oh. Does he like that or? Because he had like 
it seems like they, they obstructed his vision or view nope. in no way whatsoever. <laughs> So 2.3 acres expansion, yeah, as in, where's the mouse? Here, this area here, that was part of the expansion, yeah. Um, a zone for plan development in the business district. In other words, the owners can use that land for banks, department stores, apparel stores, supermarkets, and restaurants. Nevertheless, opponents of the expansion argue that it was not in conformity with the applica applicable zoning restrictions. As in, we don't like to have Walmart coming to town. Huh? I would count Walmart as a apparel shop, supermarket, or department store. Let's do a five minute break. Stretch, guys. <laughs>